Welcome back to Geology. Today I want to continue on with chapter 10. And this part deals with absolute time, the other way geologists think of time. And uh, sometimes it's called numerical time. And remember, this one's based on the atomic clock on radioactivity. And in 1896, uh, radioactivity was discovered by Henri Becquerel. And that really uh, allowed scientists to start trying to figure out how this radioactivity worked and especially by the works of Marie Curie, one of uh, Becquerel's grad students, were able to determine how to use uh, uh, radioactivity to, to come up with ages, because one of the things about radioactive elements is that they, they decay at a constant rate. Decay at a constant rate. So in other words, they start off from some, usually we talk about some parent atom decaying to a daughter atom. So it's always parent to daughter. We measure the parent and the daughter atoms in the rock or the mineral. Now, a radioactive atom, the parent atom, uh, is unstable. It decays at a constant rate, always involved. And so this, this decay always involves, always involves a change in the atomic number, right? Uh, uh, for example, carbon-14 has atomic number 6, and it will decay to nitrogen 14, nitrogen uh, 14, which has atomic mass or, or atomic number of seven, atomic number of seven. So there's a change in the number of protons. So the key thing about radioactivity is the protons, the number of protons change. In this case, they increase by one. Um, this this type of decay is known as as beta decay. I'll talk about those that type of decay in a moment, but that's beta decay. Now. A radiogenic atom, the daughter atom, is is said to be produced by this radioactive decay. So, so in in we'll talk about in, in a closed system, right at the beginning of when this atomic clock begins to 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 tick, or when it's going to start counting time, we're going to start off with one hundred percent parent atoms, one hundred percent parent atoms. Over time, we're going to grow those radiogenic atoms, right? So you need time for uh, uh, the growth of a daughter atom. So at the beginning, there's going to be no daughters. Eventually, these parent atoms are going to decay, and some of them will be converted to daughter atoms, right? And that'll be after some time. Now, um, it and that depends on the, the, the decay rate of the radioactive atom, and the way we're going to count them, uh, we're going to use half-life, as you'll see in a moment. So the other big thing to talk about here are isotopes. Remember, uh, isotopes are atoms of the same element that vary in their atomic mass. So they're going to have different numbers of neutrons. For example, uh, by convention, remember the, the isotope uh, or the mass number is always in the superscript, whereas the atomic number is always in the subscript, right? So these three atoms are all carbon because they all have six protons in their nucleus, six protons in the nucleus, but see they vary in their number of neutrons because remember the, the atomic mass is the addition of protons plus neutrons, right? So these are the three uh, isotopes of carbon. Uh, this is the one that's radioactive right here. Uh, remember we talked about the carbon-13 ratios here for, for biomarkers. Uh, and then for uranium, you can see uranium has three isotopes as well. There's 234, 235, and 238. They're all uranium because they, each of these has 92 protons in the nucleus. They just vary in their number of neutrons. I mentioned beta decay, but there are, there are three fundamental types of decay. And the first one I want you to know about is called alpha decay. And so what happens, and the key thing with alpha de decay, is that the nucleus of a parent atom loses two protons and two neutrons, right? So that's going to result in a change of, of negative four in atomic uh, mass. We're going to decrease the mass by four because we're changing four, we're losing four um, significant weights from the nucleus, two protons, two neutrons, right? Uh, so the, the mass number decreases by four, right? Mass number. Uh, however, because we only lose two neutrons, the the atomic number decreases by two, right? So this type of decay is common in uranium. And for example, uranium-238 uh, undergoes an alpha decay. 
And so note that we see a four mass change here in the atomic number, but we see a two atomic number change here. So we go from, so the atomic number 90 is, uh, is the atom thorium, right? And you'll see uranium has a very long decay chain. It, it undergoes alpha decay, there's some beta decays, more alpha decays. Uh, we'll talk about that in a moment um, because one of the articles I want you to read about uh, is about coral dating. And they use uh, the, the 234 to thorium 230 decay. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But for now, uh, just understand that this alpha decay is, is basically a big, in fact, they call it the alpha particle. It's a pretty big particle. Uh, um, and two protons, two neutrons. Now, the second type of decay is the beta decay. And beta decay is what example what happens in carbon, carbon-14. So what happens is, uh, remember, uh, uh, neutrons in the nucleus have both positive and negative charges. Neutrons have both positive and negative charges. So basically what happens is a beta particle is lost from the nucleus, right? So you lose that negative particle from the nucleus. So when you lose that negative particle, that neutron gets converted to a proton, right? So uh, an electron is lost from a nucleus, uh, uh, converts a neutron to a proton, right? So the atomic number is increased by one, but the mass number does not change. The mass number or the, or the atomic mass does not change. For example, carbon-14 to nitrogen-14, right? All we did was take an electron out of a neutron here and which means that neutron converts to a proton, we make it atomic number seven. So that's the, the beta decay common in the, um, in the carbon-14 uh, um, dating there. The last or the third type of decay is called electron capture. And essentially it's, it's opposite the beta decay. In this case, we're going to capture a, a, a beta particle, a negative charge into the nucleus. Right, so in, th in this case, uh, we're going to take a proton and we're going to add an electron in there, and we're going to make make that into a neutron. Right, so basically, an electron capture cap electron is captured into the nucleus, proton converts to a neutron, atomic number decreases by one. Right, because now that proton that neutron that proton is now a neutron, and the atomic mass does not change. For example, uh, uh, one of the the workhorses of, of geologic dating, of vo especially volcanic rocks, is this potassium argon system. And uh, note that the, uh, the atomic mass, or the mass number, does not change. The isotope number is still 40. However, the atomic mass, see that it decreases by one. Decreases by one, right? So we go from potassium 40 to argon 40. So that's electron capture. Now this next concept is the half-life, right? And it's a, it is a diff it's difficult to count individual decays of atoms because atoms are tiny, but we can measure how long it takes for a group of parent atoms to decay, right? We can measure uh, this um, more accurately or, or more easily. And remember the, the, the half-life, if, if you want to define half-life here, the half-life is the time necessary to decay a given number of parent atoms by one half. With that concept of half-life, we're going to create these decay curves. And the decay curve is going to have basically the fraction of parent remaining here on the y-axis and the number of half-lives that have elapsed on this x-axis. And usually we signify the, the half-lives, the number of half-lives as t, as t for time. One, one half-life, two half-lives, three half-lives, t. Uh, this would be the fraction of that parent atom remaining of the radioactive parent. So you can think of this as parent decay. And that's what I'm showing up here. So we have, uh, uh, let's say we have a thousand parent atoms. After one half-life, we're going to have 500. After two half-lives, 250. After three, 125, and so on. So that's what this curve is plotting there, right? So these would be, so if I could put a T here, these would show the, the number of half-lives elapsed. At the beginning, when the thousand parents we have zero half-lives elapsed, so we'll have zero daughter product. Uh, after one half-life, there'll be 500 parent atoms, but we have, would have grown 500 daughter atoms. After two half-lives, we'll be down to half of 500, which is 250. And then uh, at two half-lives, we would have grown 750 daughter products, right? So in essence, there's another curve that we could plot on here, and that would be the, the daughter growth. So at, at after one half-life, we'd, we'd have both 
500 parents and 500 daughters. After two half-wives, we'd be at 750 right here, daughters. And then for 3, 8, 75 right in here. And then you can see as we keep going, we're just going to be cutting this in half and in half. Uh, and, and we'll produce basically a, a, a mirror curve that's going to show daughter growth. Remember the key to the daughter growth is that this is radiogenic dot. Now there are many different isotopes used in isotopic dating and each isotope will have its own individual half-life, uh, its own decay rate. We'll come back to this diagram here in a moment. Now each isotope's half-life is constant and it's well known. It's been measured in multiple laboratories here on Earth, it's been measured in the Skylab, it's been measured up in space, so a variety of different places, and we get the same number. So it's a universal constant, universal constant. We calculate the age of a mineral by measuring the ratio of parent to daughter isotopes in the mineral. In the mineral. So the key thing, we wanna know the number of parent and the number of daughter atoms. And, and what we use, we use a machine called a mass spectrometer. This mass spectrometer uh, basically uses a sector magnet in a vacuum and can spread the isotope masses out to measure individual atoms. Let's go to this concept of a closure temperature. Uh, isotopic dating is based on a closed system. So the system has to close, essentially trap or cage in the radioactive atoms uh, uh, so that they can't escape and, the, and any daughter product that's grown is also trapped in that cage, right? And the, really that cage is a mineral lattice. So the parent atom cannot escape and the radio, de, radiogenic daughter atoms cannot escape as well. So you have the parent, the number of parent atoms remaining plus the, the growth of those radiogenic daughters, right? For example, a really good mineral for isotopic age dating, especially in igneous rocks, uh, is the mineral zircon because zircon has a closure temperature of about a thousand degrees or maybe a little bit warmer than that. So it's really good for, for granitic rocks, anything that cool from a magma. Whereas hornblende, which is another mineral that, that crystallizes from magma, has a, a much lower closure temperature of about 530 degrees centigrade. Um, so that hornblende is good uh, for the potassium argon system. Now, uh, when we're looking at, at the best rocks to date isotopically, it's gonna be the igneous rocks. We can use metamorphic rocks and metamorphism. You, you can try to get protolith ages, especially if you're using zircons. And remember, the temperature is staying in the solid state. So zircon may give you uh, closure temperatures, although the system may open. And sometimes when the system opens, you can figure out when that occurs and you get the, the timing of metamorphism. But really, the best rocks for isotopic dating are going to be the igneous rocks, lava flows, plutonic rocks. Thank you.